Good morning. Hopefully by now you've digested all of Thanksgiving. You're no longer in a food coma. Anybody, everybody done with that part of, of their life? Oh man, I am still full, I feel like. Uh, I, I, I want to just, I know that like typically this should be like the Thanksgiving message. You know, like that's the way real pastors do it. I don't know if I'm a real pastor or not, but um, I, I am so really so thankful for all of you and, and this church and just our leaders, our team, my family. I, I just so grateful. Um, but most of all, I, I, I want to give a time to just really remember and be thankful for Jesus. You know, like I, we, we do the classic, typical, like actual Thanksgiving, you know, meal with the family around and we literally go one by one and we share what we're thankful for. And it is a little nerve wracking and it feels a little bit like pressure, you know, like, oh gosh, I got to come up with this thing and, and what am I grateful for? And you know, like you kind of dig deep and you're like, oh, that's the thing. Okay, I'm going to share that. And then the person before you takes that and you, the rule is at our table, you can't say what somebody else has said and you're like, dang it. I have to be thankful for two things. Man. But one of the things, like, it's a day, you know. Thanksgiving is a day. But we're to live with a, a thankful heart all year round. And, and really to point that thanks to Jesus, like, to really just simply take some time to, to hit the pause button on life and just go, Lord, I'm just so thankful to you. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful that you took me as a young man who was so full of pride and you, you stopped the shenanigans and you caught me my attention. Lord, I'm thankful for my family that you've provided for me. You know, like, I'm just so grateful for what you, you've done. And I just want to, I know sometimes some people might think this is awkward, but I'm leading and I don't care. But like, let's take, let's take a few seconds in silence and just thank Jesus. That we would remember why we're, why we're even gathered here to get to, to today. That we would go, Jesus, just thank you for meeting me in that moment. Thank you for that intervention. Thank you for transforming my life. Thank you for that moment when I said yes to you and my life has never been the same. Thank you, Jesus, for the people you've put around me. Can we just take 15, 20 seconds to do that? Amen. You know, like, sometimes we got to fight through the awkward to get to the moment that Jesus wants your attention. And so sometimes it takes actually, like, pushing through that because we're so addicted to our phones, we're so addicted to something else, we're so addicted to just change and fast pace and calendar and busy. And, and there is something in just the being with that is really, really profound the last couple of weeks we've been talking about this series, let's talk about Jesus. And I want to continue doing that. Um, I want to be a church that talks about Jesus. I want to be a people that like actually have communication and actually verbalize what is Jesus doing in my life? What, is, uh, what are the things that I'm reading in scripture? What, what has he been doing in my life? Where do I see him showing up? And, or maybe what are the areas where I just feel like I'm in a total drought and I just need Jesus desperately, but I'm like, where are you, Lord? Um, that we would be a people that really engage on the conversation of the spiritual matters of God, um, that we wouldn't just uh, come here, receive something, and then leave, and then put that on the shelf, and then come back to church the next week, but that we would really engage. Um, the last couple of weeks, we've really been talking about how Jesus is so relatable. Um, as a human, he's relatable. As a man, he's relatable. He took on flesh, that he understands the, the sorrow and the pain and the tragedy and, and the cuts that you get on your hand. Like, he gets all of that. He understands all of it. 
Um, last week we talked about the temptation of going into the desert, and, and before that I just really took some time to talk about how he was just baptized by John the Baptist, and the heavens opened up, and the, and the Father like uh, he just broke open the heavens and declared, this is my son, right? And, and the first attack of the enemy, the first temptation of the enemy was doubt, like, if you are the son of God, Okay, so Jesus was already had this proclamation from the Father, you are my son, and so it confirmed in him, and then, and then he says, oh, this is my son, by the way, whom I love and whom I'm well pleased with, like, I am pleased with my son, and I love my son, and, and it just was this moment where I was like, man, Jesus must have carried this with him through thick and thin through his ministry, that there's this reminder of, of the Father reminding me that I am his son and, and I am loved and I'm cared for and that, that he's actually pleased with me before I did any of the ministry. So just even take a minute and go, man, Jesus, Lord, I thank you that you love me before I've done all the work. Before I've, I've done all the things that are on my checklist, you know, before I've done all the miracles, before I've done all the, the new things, that before I've gone and changed the world like we all want to do, you know, like, I thank you, Lord, that you, you love me right now. You see me. You, you, you say, I love you. Does he want me to continue going forward? Absolutely. But there's, there's a place of, of um, I don't know, just something that buoys us in our soul when we get to that point of going, I'm, just, I'm loved by the Lord. And in the midst of everybody and expectations and pressures, those are all there, but I'm loved. And that's, that's incredibly powerful that I want to just continue to, to point toward. So Jesus was tempted in every way, you know, those, those three uh, times that the enemy came to him in the desert. But, but it says that in Scripture that he was tempted in every way. That's what Hebrews says, but yet he didn't sin. You know, he, he was the one who overcame temptation. He is the one who actually we can go to in our temptations and say, Lord, help me. Jesus, you, you understand, you know, you are the one who actually got through all this without sinning. Help me understand how to get through this temptation without falling. And, and we can go to this, this Jesus that is in love with us and wants to help us and wants to walk with us, who will give us the path of life, who will, who will show us the path of life. And so he'll walk with us through these temptations. But also he's provided the body of Christ collectively together to help one another through those things as well. And so I just, I want to continually point out to that and be the people that talk about this Jesus who is relatable to us because he's been through all these temptations. He gets it. He gets every aspect of it. There's nothing that we've experienced that he goes, oh, man, I didn't, I don't really know about that one. You know, like Jesus is eternal. He's, he's the beginning and the end. He's been, he's seen it all, been through it all. He gets it all. And so he can look at your situation and he can go, man, I, I, I totally understand. So not only does he understand how to get through it, but he also understands how to have compassion and actually engage with you through the matter then he can actually walk with you as you're dealing with the bitterness in your heart or the challenge in your heart or the, the massive disappointment, the hole in your heart that goes, oh my gosh, what do I do from here? And Jesus puts his arm around us and he goes, I love you, I see you, I'm walking with you, and I know how to get through it. So let's be a people that talk about that kind of Jesus. Because people far from God, they don't really want theology, they, they want that Jesus. We, you can teach theology all day long, but they want a Jesus that's relatable, that goes, oh, they're searching for Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. They're all searching for Jesus. They just need a name. <laughs> they, need, they just need the name of Jesus and, and the, the actual understanding of, of dying on that cross and rising again and, and what he's done in us and the testimony that comes from it. So, so let's make this a normal practice in, in our walk with one another. Like as you come to church, like I'm gearing up to actually share something today with people around me in conversation and relationship, not just to receive something, but actually to give something. Um, that, that actually makes a really powerful experience at church and with relationship anyway outside of church is when you actually engage and give away, you you're going to begin to see way more of what the Lord wants to do with you in every moment. Um, I, I've just said that Jesus' relatability is the bridge to those far from God, like to, to reach every person. Like this is something that we can use just as even, I mean, if you want a strategy, but just how has Jesus been ma made real to me and how can I share and offer that with others? Uh, I'll keep on sharing this verse, Romans 10, 14. Paul speaking to the Romans here, he says this, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone 
preaching to them. We all have a voice. And there's going to be that moment in life where you actually, I've said it every single weekend, but I'm going to continue to say it, but as you continually lean into what the Lord has for you, he's going to see the people that you're connected with, and he's going to see that, oh, oh, by the way, he's going to highlight on you, your heart and mind, like, oh, the Lord actually loves this person, and he wants to bless them, and maybe he'll do it through me. Now, that can happen in actions and deeds, that's, that's fine, but eventually, how will they know, how will they understand unless somebody tells them? Unless somebody shares the message of the gospel with them, the, shares the, the goodness of, of God with them, that's the moment where we have to actually take a step in of faith instead of, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. I just, I'm... And then we miss our chance. And I don't want to give that chance to somebody else. The Lord's privileged me to, to have that opportunity with somebody else. So I, I want to I take them and share the gospel with other people. So, Let's look at Matthew chapter 8. If you'd open up to Matthew chapter 8, and as you're going there, um, I want to share a couple of quick things to review on as we we get to this point. So Jesus was just baptized by John the Baptist. Okay, we talked about that. He was led into the wilderness. He was led. Everybody say led. Okay, he was led by the Holy Spirit. So I just want to share with you this this idea that as humans, we all want to be led. Uh, There's... Like, even as a senior pastor of Life Church, I, I, am, I am led. Like, I have authority over me. I have people speaking into my life that I'm accountable, that I, that I am also led. And that takes, a, that takes a dose of humility, and it takes an understanding. Man, even Jesus was led. He was led into the desert, fasted for 40 days, tempted by the devil three, three different times. And I shared that message last week, so go, go back and listen to that. After that 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and prayer, the enemy comes and attacks and does all that stuff. And then right after that, he's ministered to by the angels. And then this is when ministry really begins. This is when, when he's launched out into his ministry. This is when preaching begins to happen. This is when healings begin to happen. This is when he begins to release uh, the prisoners, right? Like he, he, he heals people that are bound by demonic um, authority. And so he does all of this. And then all of a sudden, people start coming. He, he begins to gain this, this massive following. He begins to have all of these people that are starting to follow Jesus. So no matter where he goes, man, he's always surrounded by people. Who is an introvert in the house? Like, that is, like, terrorizing. Um, for the few extroverts, you're like, yeah, bring on all the people all the time. And everybody's like, everybody else is like, I need to find a nap. I need quiet. But this is what's happening, right? And Jesus knew this. He understood what what the mission was and most likely what was going to be happening. So all these followers come. And then what I love is that then he goes up on the mount and he has the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you'd go back and read that, we won't do that today. It's far too long. This is the known as the best, longest sermon ever preached. Supposedly it was about two to three days worth of sermons from Jesus. Uh, Anybody want to go two to three days right now with me? Come on, anybody with me? Yeah. If it was Jesus, we'd be all in, right? And this guy, we're we're good for another 20 minutes, maybe, okay? I understand. I get it. So here's the deal. As As Jesus ended his sermon, the crowds were all there, and this is what it says. It says at the end of seven, it says, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. He taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So they recognized that Jesus was far different from the Pharisees. The Pharisees just carried the law and they carried the rule book and you do this or you don't do this and it's, it's very rule-driven and law-based and ceremonial. Like It was so strict and it was never relational and Jesus is carrying this authority from heaven and he's preaching this message that actually I'm going to share in a second is extremely difficult actually. He says some things that are like heavy hitters that would make most of us run away. I don't know, I don't know, I don't like that. It hurts my feelings. Ah. And so here we are. He, 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 everybody is amazed at his authority. That word authority is the right to act, ability, privilege, capacity, or designated authority. Why did he have that authority? Because he was God and man. He had the authority from heaven, from the Father, to, to go and do these things. And so he began speaking with this new gospel message that was contrary to what the Pharisees were speaking. It's the same word of authority that he gave and he bestowed upon the disciples. 
Um, and then it is the same authority that he's given us in Jesus' name. So when we actually pray and then we close our, our prayer with, in Jesus' name, we're actually claiming that authority, that authority that says it's delegated authority. It's given to us on behalf of the Lord. So we have this power uh, uh, and authority that's given to us by the Lord, and we can proclaim in Jesus' name, and we have that ability to do. So it's the same exact authority that Jesus is using here that we have right now. The same authority, this, the, 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 the same power of the Spirit that lives within us that, that rose Christ from the dead. That if you are a believer, a professing Christian, that you've uh, asked for forgiveness and, and repented and said, Jesus, come into my life, there's an infilling of the Holy Spirit where the Spirit of the living God is within you. And you have the power, the dunamis power, this authority power to call on Jesus' name in any situation that you might find yourself in. Isn't it interesting that we, we can so easily forget this? Like it's so easy to just simply like fade away from our understanding that, that in any situation I can come in to a room and change the dynamic. Why? Because the Spirit of God is with me. That I can change the dynamic of an entire room, that a, a, a room with many people in it, just because I, I have the Spirit of God with me. And I can pray and ask the Spirit, Lord, give me, an under, give me understanding about what's going on here. Reveal to me, what do, what do you want from me here? And just like that, you have this authority that is incredibly powerful and moving. So Matthew chapter 8, if you would read through Matthew, Matthew chapter 8, maybe read 5 through 8 this week at some point, but chapter 8 is just this power-packed chapter full of Jesus' miracles, just chock full of them. I'm not going to be able to read all of them, but I'm going to speak on four of them in a matter of a few minutes, and it's going to be awesome. Are you guys ready? Are you gonna buckle up? Like, come on, like dig in, let's go. Okay, so Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and we'll just start from there. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. So here we go. So right away, right after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is coming down from the mountain, okay? This is, this is what's going on, okay? And it says that a large crowd is following Jesus, okay? Just like what we've explained. But the thing that you have to understand is he just said some really hard things in the Sermon on the Mount. Let me just share a couple of, a couple of the things that he said. Just, these are just a few. Take, your plank, take the plank out of your eye before you look at the speck in somebody else's. Okay, look at, like, Stop judging people. You've got to deal with this first before you even have any, any uh, way to, to come after somebody else. Wide is the gate and broad is the road to destruction. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yeah, I know you have problems. Yeah, I know you have challenges. Yeah, I know you're burdened by a lot of things. But you know what? If you'd seek my kingdom first and my righteousness, all those other things will fall into place. So he's really helping shift their, their, their thinking, their paradigm. He's like really going after it here. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Who's producing fruit? Everybody. Everybody's producing fruit, right? Come on, Reggie. <laughs> that's, that's some hard language. And it hurts our feelings. And in our society today, if we're not careful, we'll allow our feelings to lead our faith instead of letting our faith dictate our feelings. There's a major difference there. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Man, this is intense. But Jesus needs to share these things because he really needs to present the gospel to them. Hey, there's a good and the bad. He needs to talk to them about the truth of the reality that they're in, that sin is a, is a binding deficit that we can't overcome without him. So he has to tell them the truth, but he does it in love. He does it over two or three days where he's talking about this. Can you? I, it's not in there, but I can also picture a little bit of when he's sharing, if it's really over this time span, where people might go, um, what, do you, what do you mean by that? 
Because he probably had more conversations than just what's written. And yet, he comes down the hill, off the mountain, and it says, large crowd was still following Jesus. This is just tells me more and more that truth matters. And people actually are leaning into truth and want truth far more than, than this false reality. So he engages with this man with leprosy. In fact, the man with leprosy comes in to him. And so let me just talk about leprosy for a second. It says this, leprosy, obviously a lot of us know what leprosy is. If not, it's a disease that attacks your skin. And it goes far, so far into your body that, that it cuts off nerve systems and, and it cuts off blood flow. And eventually, if it's really bad, uh, leprosy will cause like fingers to fall off, hands to fall off, feet to fall off, toes, all that stuff, ears. You know, it's beautiful. Uh, it's really what you want to hear about in, on Sunday morning. But this is a nasty disease, right? And it's contagious. So it's, it's a big problem. But leprosy is this, and, and this is how the word describes it, as unclean. Outcast, uh, permanent quarantine. Anybody understand that today? No physical touch. Okay, you have to understand that this man has had no physical touch since he's been diagnosed with leprosy. Doesn't say how long he's been it, been there, you know, with leprosy. As soon as you see it, you have to have it checked out. If it's leprosy, you have to leave your family. You have to leave your friends. You have to leave your community. You leave everything. And you're literally an outcast outside of the city. This is what happens with leprosy. Isolated, constantly judged, disconnected, hopeless, excommunicated from family and community, and contagious. <clears throat> this outcast or these outcasts would pretty much be together, but they would be a massive burden to society. And for one of them to come to Jesus would have been, like, not okay. In fact, any, any one of them to come into any crowd, they would have to yell, hey, leper, unclean, so that people would have to move out. You know, we used to have this, like, six-foot distance thing. Yeah, this was, like, 15 feet or farther. So if a man with leprosy would come into the crowd like we're hearing here, he would walk in, and I don't know if he shouted or not, it doesn't say, but he went through the crowd in order to, what, kneel at the feet of Jesus and say, if you're willing. So here's this man who's unclean, who actually, in most parts of this society, would have been stoned legally just because of that, because he was putting other people at risk. So he has the audacity and this courage that's built up within him just to like, I'm going to go against the grain because I need to get to Jesus. It sounds like he's doing whatever he can to get to Jesus. Do we do everything that we can to get to Jesus? Like, it's so easy for us to get to Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, we are so distracted. I love Corey Ten Boom. She says, or I think it was her father who really said it. Said, if the, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll just make you busy. Like, it's just so easy. But this man with leprosy comes and he falls at the feet of Jesus. So no matter what state you find yourself in, you've got to come after Jesus. In order to be touched by Jesus, we have to go against cultural norms. And then he says, if you're willing... That means to me that he says, I know you can heal me. It's only if you're willing or not. If you're willing, Lord, I, I'm in. I'm all in. So Jesus reached out and he touched the leper before he said a word. No one would have touched this man. In fact, when he was coming through the crowd, the crowd probably backed off like this. They probably tried to find a, a far, as far away as possible from this guy. So everybody's, while everybody's leaning out, the guy comes to Jesus' feet and Jesus leans in and he touches him, which automatically he would have been ceremonially unclean and that would, that would go against the law. And Jesus said, I don't care about the law, I care about the man. I care about this person. I care about this one who's calling out my name and saying, if you're willing. And Jesus just simply touched him. He says he touched him. He didn't touch him and then he was healed, he just touched him. I think this was more comforting and compassionate than anything. The miracle came when he spoke a word. 
The miracle came, said, I am willing, so be clean, and then immediately he was clean. But the touch was a, a point of humanity. That was a point of compassion. That was a point of like just connection with another person that Jesus actually leaned in when everybody else has been leaning out, maybe for decades for this guy. This could have been the first touch this guy had 40 years. Because you're, when you're outcast, you're either there until you miraculously overcome whatever is going on, or you die. This man received the physical touch and the healing, which is incredible. So Jesus leans in when everybody leans out. And the point about leprosy that I just want to point out real quick is um, throughout Scripture, and especially the Gospels, you'll see a couple times with leprosy, but sin is spiritual leprosy. Okay, sin is spiritual leprosy. Sin, when engaged with, um, is spiritual leprosy, meaning you are disconnected from, from the Lord. Sin is, is a binding effect that will keep you away from the Lord. So spin, sin is spiritual leprosy. But as soon as Jesus touches, as soon as we come to Jesus' feet and say, Jesus, forgive me, freedom. Freedom from sin. Just like that. Forgive me. Heal me, Lord. I want to encourage you, if you've been on that fence, if you've been battling that, that you would fall at Jesus' feet and see what happens with your life. All right, moving on. Verse 14. <clears throat> when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Pretty simple here. But Peter's house was kind of the, the household that they would go to when they were around this area, and they would hang out here. And, and Jesus came to the house, most likely for rest, most likely for food, because why? He's a man, he's human, he needs to eat and he needs to sleep. So Jesus goes there, but when he gets there, it says that he sees Peter's mother-in-law. But not only that, it says that he sees her fever, he sees the sickness, and he then touches her. He touches her hand which is, again, two strikes, actually, because he touched a woman, and then he touched a woman who was sick. So he would have been unclean again. But yet Jesus says, I have overcome. I'm going to touch her, and the fever was immediately gone. What I love about this is he didn't say a word. It's just the powerful touch of Jesus, where he just sees a need, and he sees this woman hurting, and and it says the fever, actually the way it's broken down, it was fire. So it sounds like it was a very hot, high fever. Jesus just touches her hand. The fever leaves her. And then immediately, what does she do? She gets up and she starts serving him. Friends, this is like such an easy message. When Jesus touches you, when he heals you, when he transforms you, when he make, puts a mark on you, when he does something in you, our automatic response should be, Lord, how can I serve you? What do you need, Lord? What, what can I do? How can I serve you? But more than that, salvation is like, man, you saved my life. Here, I'm yours. Whatever you want, Lord, I am, I'm all in. I'm all in for you, Jesus. So she got up and started serving Jesus, and that's something that we ought to do as well. Matthew 8, 16, one verse down, and it's just this one verse. It says this, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought into him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and he healed all the sick. So Peter, uh, Jesus and Peter, they're still hanging out at his house. Peter's mother-in-law got up and started serving, which is amazing, and just caring for the people there, and, and probably just doing what she loved to do. And then, but all of the people knew where Jesus was, so they began to bring people to Peter's house, and just crowding, crowding, crowding his house. And it says that when evening came, many who were demon-possessed, Man, many who were demon-possessed were, were brought in by their friends. That word brought, I want to just, just remind us, brought is this. It says they brought their loved ones to carry a burden or to move by carrying. So they either said, hey, come with me. I know a guy named Jesus who can heal you. Come on, let's go. I want to I carry this burden with you to the feet of Jesus. Because if he touches you, man, oh man, you're going to be set free. Or maybe, literally, like, 
we're going. We're like, I'm taking you, I'm snatching you up, and we're going to Jesus, and I'm going to lay you at the feet of Jesus so that he might touch you and heal you. So they, they brought their loved ones to the feet of Jesus You don't have to be perfect in order to bring people to Jesus. Like, I imagine all the people who brought this person, these people to Jesus, they had their own, their own stuff going on as well. And they just said, hey, I, I've been touched by this guy. I, I bet you can too. C- come on, let's go. And, and they encouraged to go to Jesus. And, and we can do the same thing. Like, come on, guys, let's go. Let's go to Jesus. And then it says, with a single word, the demons had to go. And he drove out the spirits with a word. So he sees all of these people who are (laughs) demon-possessed. And in in verse 32 there, that's where the the two men are, are bound by demons and and the demons and Jesus are having this conversation and they beg him to send him into the herd of pigs. And all, of, all that Jesus says is, go. That's the power and the authority that Jesus has over demonic, spiritual uh, things that come against us. And with a single word, a very word, they have to leave because they cannot stay in the presence of Jesus. And then he heals all the rest who were there. Okay, moving on, verse 23. Verse 23 through 27. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Anybody else ever think that that's just so strange? The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So all of that's, all of these things that are going on, right? The Sermon on the Mount, healing people at Peter's house, healing his mother-in-law. I mean, Jesus is pretty busy. And then they finally get onto a boat where it's just him and the disciples. And he goes, oh, I can finally take a nap. Like, whoa, I'm so tired. So they get in the boat, they get going on the lake, and then Jesus hits the snooze button, and he's just out. He's out cold. Waves start crashing over the boat, and Jesus is still sleeping. I, I, I just feel like it's like this is, this is humanity at its best. Anybody just get so exhausted where you finally just like, I can't do anything, and I just, and you're just like, you're out for hours, and your spouse is probably like, are you alive? Are you okay? You know, like, sometimes you just work till exhaustion, and that's what happens. Your body has to recover, and I think this is where Jesus was at. He was just exhausted, so he sleeps on the boat, and here's this huge, furious storm that comes up, the waves all over the place, and what do the disciples do? Lord, save us! We're gonna die! Like, they find Jesus, and they're trying to wake him up, going, we're gonna die! Can you imagine Jesus, like, waking up to these guys? <clears throat> He's like, water is just everywhere. I, I still don't understand how Jesus was sleeping, but that's okay. And they're just like, Lord, save us! And the way Jesus responds, it's a little aggravating to me, a little bit, because I probably, I can picture myself kind of freaking out too. You know, like I'm, I'm, I was in the Navy, but I'm not a big fan of the water, especially massive waves coming over me. Anybody else with me on this? And so they're like, Lord, come on, man, we're going to die. And he goes, oh, you have little faith. So they get rebuked a little bit here by Jesus. It's not this power, power punch, like it's just you have a little faith. You, it, it, really meant, it really means just this small amount, this, this lacking of confidence in me. And it, in Isaiah, it says, fear not, for I am with you. Jesus was with them in the boat. And he's like, you, you guys, I, have you not seen what I, I've done just in the last few days? 
Have you not seen my power and authority uh, show up in times of incredible desperation for some people? Remember the leper who was falling at my feet, who if not healed, he probably would have died. Remember that and how I actually uh, saved this guy from death, not only physical, but also spiritual? Hey guys, do you remember? And by the way, the waves are still crashing down as he's going, you have little faith. You know, our emergency isn't always the Lord's emergency. It can feel that way. But when we know that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, he's in the boat with us. He's there with us. And he's not jumping ship either. It's like, oh, you guys suck. You're terrible people. I'm out of here. That's not Jesus. He's in the boat with us. He says, you a little faith. Jesus gives us peace in the midst of the storm. So he, he kind of has this conversation with, with the disciples as they're like freaking out. And he stand, it sounds like he stands up and he rebukes the storm. And all of a sudden, it's complete calm. Probably by one word yet again by Jesus. It's amazing what one word from Jesus can do to our lives to settle us. So in the midst of the chaos and this, this crazy storm, Jesus says, be still. And the, the, the waves stop, the wind stop, and everything stops. The storm was out of control. The disciples' fear was out of control. Jesus is never out of control. He's always faithfully steady. He's always in the boat with you. He's never jumping ship on you. He's never gonna leave us nor forsake us. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Maybe you need to put it in a different way to say it. Fear not, for the Lord is with me. He's with me. He's with me. He is Jesus, you're with me. And you overcame, so I can trust that you're going to help overcome whatever I'm dealing with. Can I have the worship team come up? We're going to close in worship like we always do. As they're coming up, I just, I want to point out just how the disciples respond to this because it said they, they ask a question and, and I think like after everything's calm and all of a sudden the boat stops rocking life stops rocking you ever have these moments of clarity like all of a sudden it's like oh I can I can see I can I can breathe I can I'm not gonna die I'm like I'm okay and and they they kind of are looking at each other and they're not asking this question I don't think in doubt they're asking it in awe and wonder of the Lord and and something that we ought to strive to actually continue to press in on the awe and wonder of God he go they go what kind of man is this what kind of man is this so they saw all the spiritual miracles the physical healing miracles but they hadn't seen the, the nature miracles yet. This is the first experience of, of them going, whoa, this guy, he, not, he has authority over the earth, over the wind, over the waves. He's got, he's got this incredible authority. And they ask this question, what kind of man is this? And I, it just makes me encourage you this morning that, you can still have questions and faith simultaneously that we might actually continue to wonder and have these awestruck moments of, man, God, you are so beyond the way I can think. You're just so far beyond that, but I trust you. I believe that, that you're my savior. I believe that, that you healed this leper. I believe that you touched Peter's mother-in-law and she was healed. Those are the moments where we get to just come back and recollect and even the things in our own life. Let's stand together. As we close out in worship, just always want to offer this opportunity. Like this may be your moment to say, this is the Jesus that I, want to, I, that I believe in now. Like, I, I, yes, I'm in. Jesus, have your way. So in worship, you can simply just go, Jesus, have your way. I'm yours. Forgive me for my sin. I believe in you. I believe in all your miracles. I trust in you. But it might be the fact that you might be freaking out like the, the disciples, save me, Lord! 
And, and I just can picture him just putting his hand on your shoulder saying, hey, I'm, I'm with you. I've got you. Fear not, for I'm with you. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, we love you. And we offer you this, this moment of worship and reflection of, this is us and you now, Lord. This isn't any more preaching. This is just a response of worship. So Lord, I ask that as we worship we would just surrender our hearts and our, our lives to you, Lord. And uh, yeah, Lord, that you just meet us, Lord, that we be honest with you in every part of our life right now. In Jesus' name, amen.